has been intended to have. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Ernest. And now that we have invited the Holy Spirit and Onyanko Pong to be with us, we can safely start our Pension Strategy Conference. As I mentioned, for those of you who joined us in our first edition in the 2019 Pension Strategy Conference, and last year, we say we are welcome and you are certainly going to enjoy this session as well. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we say we are happy to have you as well, Wizo and Aquaba. We know that you very much enjoy this session. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to start straight into our program with an opening remarks from a man that he himself has been very active in the pensions industry, as well as the fund management space with over 15 years experience in helping multinationals and institutions to set up pension schemes for their employees. He himself has set up Access Pension Trust as a co-founder and is currently the Chief Executive Officer of Access Pension Trust. I'm happy to invite, to give us the opening remarks, Mr. Efriye Owari. Hello, Efriye. Hello, Jeff. Um, thank you very much. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you are warmly welcome to the third edition of the Pension Strategy Conference. So this conference is an initiative by Access Pension Trust in collaboration with the CFA Society of Ghana. It is designed to shape pension investment thinking, empower trustees with expert insights and generate new ideas for pension policy makers. We live in unprecedented times, in a volatile, uncertain, complex, ambitious, and disruptive world. That's the vocab world. A major lesson to learn from the COVID-19 pandemic is the need to build a resilient, self-reliant economy that is anchored on a vibrant private sector. The challenges facing Ghana's private sector are well known so I will not belabor the point. However, as institutional investors whose liabilities are medium to long-term, we should be deeply concerned about how our private sector is financed. In 2019, Ghana's private sector credit to GDP was 12.4% as against 139% for South Africa 32% for Botswana and 27% for Kenya. As of December 2019, total loans and advances to the private sector was 39 billion Ghana cities, representing 30% of total banking industry assets. The situation in the pension industry is no different. According to the MPRA, a paltry 7.2% of the pensions industry assets as of December 2019 was directly invested in the private sector. In general asset allocation, I would say the insurance industry is a step ahead of pensions, but falls short of the expected financing to the private sector. Of the 3.8 billion total assets managed by life insurance companies in 2019, 28% was invested in property, 9% in listed equities, 3% in corporate debts, and 1% in an asset class that was classified as related party investment. So critically speaking, the life insurance industry direct funding to private sector in 2019 was just 3%. Non-life companies were not very different. Out of 2.8 billion total assets, managed by life, non-life companies in 2019, 26% was held in property, 19% in listed equity, and less than 1% was allocated to corporate debt. So in brief, regulated financial institutions in Ghana allocated just about 46 billion in credit to the private sector out of total assets of approximately 153 billion in 2019. In comparison, government desktop, domestic desktop, I would say, was 105 billion as of December 2019. 
So it begs to ask the question, whether the public sector is the engine of growth for the Ghanaian economy. Your guess is as good as mine. We cannot continue to muzzle the ox that treads the gray. Much as investment in government securities seem default risk free, I must caution that it comes with severe long-term inflation risk. For pension fund liabilities to maintain purchasing power in the long term, allocating more capital to the private sector, particularly through alternative asset class is not negotiable. Our industry can learn from the insurance industry by allocating a minimum of pension fund assets to the real estate sector. I would say momentum is building towards alternative asset class, which in 2019 stood at 2%. This is why this year's pension, in, the pension strategy conference is focused on how alternative asset class investing can create value for pension funds. And so this morning we have lined up great speakers, experts in their respective fields to share their rich experience with us. This morning's activities will start with a presentation on Ghana's economic prospect for this year. Our keynote speaker, Mr. Kweku Adoboli, will address the topic of mortgage debt securitization and this will be followed by a presentation on opportunities in real estates in Ghana by Tony Setre of Brawl Ghana. There is an equally rich menu set for tomorrow, and I believe you will make a date with us tomorrow as well. Ladies and gentlemen, join me to appreciate our speakers for agreeing to share their knowledge and their insights with us. To you, our cherished participants, thanks for joining this webinar. Let me also recognize the tireless efforts of the team at Access and the CFA Society for putting this event together. Do enjoy the conference. Thank you very much. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you very much, Efie, as well. And as I said, Efie is the Chief Executive Officer here at Access Pension Trust, and he is a co-founder as well uh, of the company. Thank you very much for that warm welcome and introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, just like Efriye mentioned, this is a two-day session that we will be having, and tomorrow we would have our panel discussion. This is supposed to be a very interactive conference, and so I would encourage you to put up any questions that you may have in our question and uh, answer chat area. Our, our presenters would respond to them at the appropriate time. Kindly also note that this webinar is being recorded. And so in later time, we may make available um, this recording. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to start straight to our first presenter who is speaking on Ghana's economic outlook. He is currently an economist with specialization in monetary economics and international economics, as well as public finance. He holds a bachelor's degree and an MPhil in economics from the University of Ghana, Lagos. He has extensive experience in the last five years in his role as a senior economist and enjoys sharing both his view on fiscal and monetary policy through interactions with local and international partners and investors. Ladies and gentlemen, he also enjoys publications as well as media interaction. I'm happy to invite to give us a presentation on Ghana's economic outlook, Mr. Courage Kingsley Mate. Hello, Courage. Good morning, Jeff, and thanks for having me. Great, and a very I hope you are doing morning. well. Absolutely, I'm doing well. I hope you're doing well yourself. Yes, I am. I remember from last year, well, one of the questions that you gave us to take away when you were asked to share what your opinion was for 2020. And you advised that investors should be cautiously optimistic. And so we will be happy to have your presentation for this year and your advice also for this year going forward. All right, that's a good one. And thanks for reminding me of, uh, of what we did last year and um, the caution that we threw you 
um, to ourselves. And it appears we had to tread cautiously last year. And I think this year as well, we had have to remain cautious as well. Um, because what we saw last year and what we are seeing this year shows that um, we are living in uncertain times, as uh, Mifri said. And so we cannot discount the impact this can have on capital and returns on capital. Um, and a very good morning to everyone on the call as well. And I'll quickly go into the presentation. Um, just trying to share my screen whilst we do that. Right. So as I go into the presentation, beginning with the outline for this presentation, the job is simple. We'll look at the performance of the Ghanaian economy in 2020, various sectors. Then we we'll also look at the domestic fixed income market and how it fared during the year. Then we also share ideas on what we expect the various economic indicators to look like in 2021. And we delve into the Q&A session. But if I am to summarize the whole presentation, I would say that last year was a very difficult year, a challenging one at that. And largely because of the COVID pandemic, a lot of shocks were exerted across various sectors of the economy. But thankfully, the Bank of Ghana came through swiftly and aggressively to release a lot of liquidity into the system. And that averted liquidity crunch in the financial system. Now, not only did it avert liquidity crunch, it created domestic demand for government of Ghana securities because at the time we had the risk of sentiment again and non-resident investors took out capital or prevented um, capital from flowing through. And so that intervention from the Bank of Ghana provided domestic demand for the elevated borrowing or increased borrowing that government had to do during the course of the year. That ultimately resulted in a decline in yields across the maturity spectrum on government of Ghana securities. As we speak, we are seeing signs of modest recovery, but this recovery is also subject to significant headwinds. And that is the point where we emphasize trading cautiously during 2021 and beyond. We would look specifically at the real sector. That's where we begin from because it was clear last year that we started the year on a positive note. The economy expanded in real time terms by 4.9%. And little, little did we know that it will collapse just in the next quarter because the pandemic hit our shores and government inevitably had to take containment measures, which resulted in a collapse in economic activity, or if you like a reversal in the growth momentum that we experienced during the first quarter of the year. And as you see in the top chart on the right hand side, that is the real growth in the composite index of economic activity, which showed a complete collapse in April when the lockdown was implemented. And that is the sharpest decline in the history of the composite index of economic activity. Now we noticed that beyond May or beyond April when the government started easing restriction, economic activity started picking up. Hence the upward turn in the slope of that particular um, curve. If you look at the graph beneath, you see the quarterly year on year growth in the economy. First quarter showed a positive growth 4.9%, but the second quarter contracted by 3.2%, largely because of the COVID containment measures, lockdowns, and imposition of restrictions. We also saw another contraction in the third quarter, although very small. Now, there was a contraction in the third quarter, despite the steady reopening, the lifting of restrictions, we still saw a contraction in the third quarter. And it, it told us that even though things are improving, the improvement is still very weak. And we try to look at the various sectors that would have suffered the most shocks. We noticed that the industry sector suffered the hardest or the biggest shock, largely because of the extractive sector, that is the mining as well as oil and gas. Then manufacturing sector also suffered significant shocks or contraction. Construction actually contracted in the first quarter, but came back strongly in the second and third quarter largely because of government infrastructure expansion in the lead up to the 2020 elections. The services sector actually turned out mixed performance. We saw positive growth for ICT and finance and insurance. For ICT, it was to be expected because a lot of demand shifted into the virtual space, but we need to also emphasize the fact that before 2020, government had already started implementing measures to enhance on the digital economy. And you recall things like the mobile money interoperability. So that has already set that sector up for growth. 
and the demand for virtual platforms only increased or supported that sector further. Finance and insurance really would say, thankfully, the Bank of Ghana had implemented the financial sector reforms from 2017 to 2019, and that helped the sector to actually withstand the shocks. The recapitalization, the rebuilding of corporate governance structures, and so on was very key in holding the finance and insurance sector up during the, the, the pandemic of last year. But trade and hospitality sectors were the hardest hit within the services sector. Because of the lockdowns and travel restrictions, trade was interrupted. And then because of the ban on public gathering, the hospitality sector also was negatively affected. We noticed, however, that the agri sector was very resilient. And this is in part, not just because of government agriculture oriented policies, but largely because if you look at the geographical spread of the virus and the containment measures such as the lockdowns, you realize that farming activity generally happens in the rural areas, but the virus was more endemic in the urban centers and the lockdowns also happened in the urban centers. So it saved the agri sector of a collapse or from a collapse. However, this, what the agri sector suffered was the distribution from the rural area or the farming community to the urban sector centers was negatively affected because of the lockdown. But that was reflected in higher inflation rather than the output in the agri sector. Now, what is most likely or we notice is that the informal sector, which has the highest number of businesses in the economy, was the most affected. And the Ghana Statistical Service tried to determine the extent of shock that the business environment or the business sectors faced during, during the year. And so they conducted what they call the COVID-19 business tracker survey. And what they found was that more than 35% of businesses were closed down during the lockdown. So that even after the lockdown was lifted, over 16% of businesses remained closed. Now this explains or partly explains why even after easing of restrictions in the third quarter, we still experience some moderate contraction in the third quarter because not all businesses reopened after the lockdown was lifted. For labor, it was also observed that over 25% of the workforce suffered a reduction in their wages. And this translated into over 770,000 workers. Even worse is that 1.4% of the workforce lost their job. And here we are referring to about 42,000 people. If you combine the effect of lower wages and loss in wages, we we'll agree that aggregate demand was compressed significantly last year. And if we follow the argument of what we call the asymmetry of labor productivity shocks, which basically tells us that when there is a downturn in the economy, employers are quick or faster to release workers than when there is an upturn, how they engage workers. So they release workers or disengage with workers faster than they re-engage with workers when things start to show better. So it means that the contraction or the compression in aggregate demand, we might not see a quick return to the normal level in the short to medium term. So the economy is likely to operate below potential over the short to medium term. On a slightly positive note, the survey also noted that firms that actually started using or increased their use of mobile money, digital platforms increased by over 37%. And actually 9% of businesses started using internet-based or online business operations. During the course of the year, government actually put in place some interventions to help business cope, businesses cope with the situation. But the survey revealed that only 3.5% of firms indicated that they received any support from the government, with most of them indicating that they were not aware of any interventions from the government. Looking into the future, the businesses that were surveyed indicated that future sales are expected to decline by an average of 24%. And in the worst case scenario, they believe that the rate at which they employ labor might even fall by about 15%. Again, this supports the fact that labor productivity shocks tend to happen asymmetrically so that they let go labor quickly during downtime, but they do not re-engage or employ labor as quickly as 
they did when they let go of labor. So it appears COVID had a damaging effect on the real sector of the economy. And the main sources of shocks were from the demand side, supply side, as well as financial shocks where working capital was negatively affected, access to credit was also adversely impacted. Now we move into the fiscal sector where we realized that government finances was badly damaged. I recall that last year when we spoke on government's initial target for 2020, the revenue expectation was 67 billion cities and we cast a doubt on the feasibility of such a target. Well, it came out that when you add COVID to the outlook of for 2020, government realized that 67 billion cities was not going to be achievable and they revised it down to 53.7 billion cities for the year. Now, the data here is as at 11 months for the year 2020, and it showed that government was able to mobilize 46.6 billion cities. Now, this translated into a growth of 4.2% year on year when compared to November the previous year. But this 4.2% is a significant decline in growth in revenue from the 17% average growth for the three years before the end. And when you consider the fact that to achieve the revised target of 53.7 billion cities, December alone needs to rake in over 7 billion cities. You ask yourself, is it possible? Well, December 2019 raked in over 8 billion cities. So you might want to say on the basis of that, it is possible. But we need to situate that argument again within the context of the fact that December 2020 saw the crystallization or the effective of effectiveness of the year of return where there was a lot of spending and VAT collections to the government. And then we also had a normal Christmas in December 2019 because there was no COVID. And so that supported the revenue collection in December 2019. December 2020, we didn't have the year of return and we didn't uh, enjoy a normal Christmas because of COVID. And so you doubt whether the spending would have supported enough VAT collection to raise over 7 billion cities during the course of the year. You can actually argue also that the elections would have boosted spending. So again, the conclusion therefore is that there is a significant downside risk to even the 53.7 billion cities revenue expectation for last year. But whether we achieve that or not, what is certain is that revenue collection for last year would be significantly below the growth, the historical growth rate. Expenditure actually grew faster than the average of 9% for the last three years. We saw expenditure growing by as much as nearly 40%. Now, largely because the government did not only maintain the initial expenditure target, but added COVID-related spending of over 11 billion cities. And that caused a spike in expenditure and ultimately widened the deficit for the year and created a high borrowing pressure. As at 11 months of last year, government had recorded a deficit of 41.6 billion cities. Now, this was against 18.1 billion cities recorded in the same period, 2019. How did they finance the deficit? Typically, the deficit would be financed from, financed from both external and domestic borrowing. So we had the euro bond issuances and other borrowings from multilateral institutions. And on the domestic front, you have issuance of bonds as well. But what we notice is that whilst 41.6 billion cities was recorded as deficit for 11 months of last year, which should have been financed from both external or would have been financed from both external and domestic sources. Net domestic financing of the deficit alone was 42 billion cities. It means that the domestic borrowing that was done by the government to finance the deficit for that period alone exceeded the deficit. That's just the domestic borrowing. And that led to an increase in the debt stock and the debt as a percentage of GDP. Here we try to just trace the increase in the debt stock for last year up to 11 months. And we noticed that the debt stock increased by over 68 billion cities. And when you try to account for the various sources of borrowing, the $3 billion euro bond that was secured, the $1 billion rapid credit facility from the IMF, and the net domestic borrowing or financing of 42 billion cities added up to 65 billion cities. I left out the World Bank borrowings and AFDB borrowing as well. And then the slight effect of currency depreciation accounted for the combined increase of 
68 billion cities in the debt portfolio. Now, when you look at the curve that we have just displayed here, what you notice is that the gradient of the, the debt to GDP ratio is the red line. And the gradient of that curve from 2019 to 2020 appears steeper than the historical trend, which tells us the extent of borrowing that was done last year. So that the debt to GDP ratio is now over 74% of GDP and higher than the threshold for market access countries. And so that again shows the kind of borrowing and the dominant effects that governments had to exert on the domestic market last year. We now move on to the price development for the year beginning with inflation where we notice that the central bank moved swiftly to increase liquidity into the system by slashing the policy rate and other monetary measures. That was very supportive of financial sector liquidity but inflation spiked as a result of the COVID restrictions or containment measures and not necessarily because of the heavy liquidity. And we say so because after inflation spiked and peaked at almost 11%, it started to decline. Now, when it was declining, liquidity was still very strong or money supply was still very strong, actually growing at a rate of two times the growth rate in the previous year. So one would have expected that given the rate of growth in money supply, it should have propelled inflation even higher. But inflation actually came down at the latter part of the year. This underscores the fact that aggregate demand during the course of last year, income levels was compressed. And so we didn't have pressure coming from the demand side to fuel inflation. It was just because the supply side was disrupted because of the lockdown measures. And again, it tells that as we go into the mid short to medium term, you will need aggregate demand to recover for economic activity to rebound to potential or above the trend level. But for now, it appears that demand levels are quite low and will remain below potential for a while. On the external front, we noticed that the exchange rate was stable. In fact, it was one of the most stable currencies on the continent last year. And that was largely because we had the central bank introducing various measures. Chief among them was the forward auctions that were done to anchor short-term exchange rate expectations and reduce the pressure on spot market um, activities. And that helped in anchoring exchange rate stability. Again, we noticed that the external account weakened. For instance, the trade surplus reduced slightly, the current account deficit widened slightly, but most importantly, the capital and financial accounts, the balance on it declined significantly in terms of the surplus. And that's largely because we saw a lot of foreign portfolio outflow during the course of the year. But reserves were not affected. Reserves actually grew slightly in gross terms because of the $1 billion facility we got from the IMF. And that helped the Bank of Ghana with its interventions during the course of the year. And so the exchange rate was stable last year. And given this efforts by the Bank of Ghana to ensure currency stability, and so far, the measures we've seen, we believe that the outlook for the CD is that of continued stability. We now touch on the fixed income market where we noticed that at the start of the year, there was a spike in yields, largely because of the impact of the COVID shocks, where we noticed that the dotted line in the, the graph there, the graph there shows the various yield curves for government of Ghana securities at different points in time during the course of last year. The red curve shows the yield curve when COVID shocks was exerted on the market and led to over 100 basis point spike in yields. But the Bank of Ghana's swift measures brought down yields and compressed yields by over 160 basis points. But by mid-year, government presented the mid-year budget and the market saw the extent of borrowing that was happening on the market and started to reprice government of Ghana securities. And we saw a slight uptick in yields and that reduced the decline in, in yields for government securities so that we closed the year with a net decline of 53 basis points for government securities across the Cape. So overall, despite the heavy borrowing on the domestic market by the government, the Bank of Ghana's liquidity or monetary interventions ensures, ensured that yields did not go beyond um, the year start level. They were actually lower than the year start level. 
And in terms of how liquidity helps the secondary market, we notice that there's a continued growth in trading volumes on the market in exponential, in exponential terms, actually. And that growth in volume traded on the market continued into this year. And we've seen that January alone saw more than two times the average monthly growth for 2020. January actually so far, we've seen an increase in foreign portfolio inflows. So the, 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 the foreign investors are beginning to come back into our market, largely because of how the currency performed last year and the fact that the fears that they had about our market did not exactly materialize. So value is seen in our market and we see foreign investors coming back into the, our market. And that is bringing down yields again further. So that currently, as the yield curve shows, the blue line tells us the yield curve as at the close of last week compared to the start of the year. And we've seen that across the curve, yields are also declining. Going forward into the year, the government strategy is to ensure that even though the public debt stock has increased as a result of the COVID-induced borrowings, their target is to ensure that the cost of this debt is controlled. And so government strategy is to compress yields for new borrowings. And we saw that being played out in the last, in the recent auctions that were done or issuances that were done on the market. And so we believe or expect that generally domestic yields will remain contained for as long as we continue to see non-resident investor demand for domestic securities, for as long as the, Gov the Bank of Ghana maintain the loose monetary policy stance, which we expect to be the case. And also for as long as the currency remains stable, which we also expect generally to be the case. Of course, there'll be some intermittent depreciation pressures, but generally we think the currency will remain stable and that should help use remain subdued during the course of the year. But the risk is that given the sizable inflow we are seeing from foreign portfolio inflows, there is also the risk that we could see an outflow, a sudden outflow, which could pose a threat to currency stability and yields. But we believe the Bank of Ghana has the manuscript from last year and they will be able to implement the same measures to contain the pressure. Then also the government has a target of raising a um, significant amount on the euro bond market or the international market this year. A large chunk of those the proceeds will be used for liability management. And that would help to keep yields compressed during the course of this year. Now, how do we see the economy or the economic indicators behaving during 2021? Beginning with growth, we believe growth is showing a signs of recovery. And so we think growth will come back into positive territory in 2021. However, we think growth will still remain below potential, given the fact that aggregate demand is compressed and will not recover over the short term until beyond the medium term. And the supportive factors for growth that we see are uh, the current recovery in oil price, we should make oil and gas production a bit more profitable, and then some oil rigs should come back on stream, holding constant production challenges on all fields. Then we also see a rebound in port activity. We should also stimulate international trade, especially as the global economy begins to reopen on the back of the rollout of vaccine. The agri sector is also expected to remain resilient during the course of this year. Like I said earlier, despite the modest recovery we see, we will still remain below our potential because aggregate demand is expected to remain low over the short to medium term. Then Ghana's plan to also start the rollout of vaccine is good news, but we don't bank our hopes on that for 2021 because we don't expect a significant amount of vaccination that will lead to a large scale relaxation of restrictions. On the downside, the resurgence in COVID infections is a downward pressure on, risk, on, on growth, and that could lead to further restrictions being imposed and could derail the growth momentum. When we move to the fiscal outlook, we believe that given the fact that the government had actually extended or expanded fiscal policy to the margin or to the limit last year, fiscal deficit compression is inevitable in 2021. And so government would now have to start rationalizing expenditure to ensure that a lot of expenditure pressure is controlled, especially given that the elections is out of the way, there is no pressure to spend. So we believe that the fiscal consolidation beginning this year will be on the back of expenditure controls. 
but we also see that there is the implementation of icons, the, the, the custom wear system that will expect that leakages at the ports is reduced. Now, this will not be new revenue measures. We don't expect new revenue or tax measures in 2021, but efforts to block revenue leakages, especially at the ports, is ongoing and is actually yielding results as at fourth quarter of last year. So we believe that this will be helpful in supporting the revenue side of government. And of course, as economic activity recovers, that should automatically translate into more revenue for the government, as well as the higher oil prices. On the downside, the resurgence in COVID infections could shock the revenue side beyond expectations and could also impose more spending pressure on the government. The government actually expects to compress the deficit from over 11% in 2020 to just around 8% in 2021. We are waiting the 2021 budget in March to confirm that figure, but that will translate into a deficit of 36 billion cities, which will be lower than the 44 billion cities that was recorded last year, but will still be high enough to exert significant borrowing pressure on the domestic market. Inflation is expected to return within the band of the central bank 6 to 10%. And we already saw that indication um, in January where it reduced to 9.9%, having spiked above the band to 10.4% in December last year. The key time period for us to start seeing the decline is the second quarter, largely because during the second quarter of last year, the consumer price index spiked as a result of the disruption to supply side, the lockdown measures. And that would have created a higher base when we calculate the second quarter 2021 inflation figure. And that would provide a favorable base for inflation to come down in the second quarter. And then the third quarter, we expect food harvest to add further downward momentum. In addition to the fact that we expect the policy regime to also be favorable for uh, a decline in inflation. So those are the drag down factors, but the push factors will likely come for, from the resurgence in COVID, which will come about and in, introduce another reimposition of restrictions and disruption to the supply side. And of course, what we are also noting is that although the recovery in oil price is good for government revenue, it is also not good for the inflation outlook because it could lead to higher export prices and that could propel inflation in non-food and headline inflation. And also recalling that during the pandemic last year, government provided some utility reliefs to the economy. Now that relief is being rolled back. And so we should see utility tariffs and inflation for utilities returning to normal. And that could also be an upside push to inflation. But overall, we see inflation coming back within the central bank target range of six to 10%, most likely closer to the 9% or at the upper 8% levels. To conclude with the currency outlook, we believe that the city has started the year very well and we expect the general stability to be sustained, largely because the central bank continue to signal commitment to continued currency stability. And given the fact that there is so much borrowing that is being done, there is high external obligation that requires or creates the incentive to continue to keep the currency stable, otherwise it could undermine debt sustainability. There is a euro bond that is supposed to come through, which should provide at least some relief for the currency, at least for 2021. So the expected issuance of the euro bond is also a plus for currency stability. The recovery in oil price is also good because um, not only will it help government coffers, but it also helps the amount that is flowed into the petroleum funds as a part of reserves and also boosts the Bank of Ghana's interventions on the market. We also expect the, government, the Bank of Ghana to strengthen its um, oversight on the market, especially when it comes to the repatriation of export receipts by mining firms, because that is also critical to ensure that there's a continued flow of, of forex onto the market. On the downside, we think that the heavy inflow of foreign portfolio investment could also be a downside risk if there's a sudden reversal in this flow. And looking at the increase so far, we noticed that foreign investor share of total domestic holdings declined to 22% of total government securities as at November last year. But as at the end of January, it's increased to 24%. And so we are seeing an increase in foreign investor holdings of government security. Again, while that is providing the needed forex to ensure currency stability, it could also be 
that we are baking in currency depreciation risk. And so that could be a depreciation risk to the outlook. And of course, the fact that investor sentiments could change in a negative direction if we don't see a moderation in the rate of COVID infections. And on that note, I think I'll have to pause here for us to take you and a as I hand over to Jeff to take over the mic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Courage. We are very, very happy. And thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we do have a few questions and I would like to um, have you respond to it. Maybe just about two or three so you can catch a bit of breath as well. Um, the first question is from Jesse. So the first question is from Jesse Opoku Isiedu. And the question is, are we seeing a strong performance in the Ghana, in the Ghana city in 2021? What is, that, what is driving this? And do you expect the momentum to continue? Uh, let me just take that again. He says, we are seeing a strong performance in the Ghana city in 2021. What is, that drive, what is driving this? And do you expect the momentum to continue? Um, I think I'll just read about three of the questions and then you can take it um, all at once. The next question is from Yabua Opoku Ware. He says, were the impacts of the COVID-19 only on the formal sector? If yes, what were the specific impact on informal sector as well? For example, with regards to loss of jobs in reduction and reduction of income? I'll take that question again. Were the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic only on formal sector? If yes, were there specific impact also on informal sector, such as job losses and reduction of income? There's also a question from maybe the last one, and then you can answer um, before we go to our next speaker. The last one is from Simon Ayem, and he's asking for confirmation if the GT, GDP forecast range is based on 2020 figures. Simon wants to know if the GDP forecast range is based on 2020 figures. Um, let me just add the very last one which just came in from Matthew. He says on the, on the balance of probabilities, is inflation likely to increase or decrease? Courage, I hope you can respond to this. Sure, and um, I'll start with the one from Jesse. Um, Jesse, I am very elated to receive your question. Um, so what is accounting for the strong performance of the Ghana city? Well, um, first of all, it is built on the, the performance we saw last year. And you know, typically these financial assets tend to move along with the sentiments on the market and given the performance that we saw last year, which was very impressive, the expectation and the credibility of the monetary policy framework to continue to anchor currency stability was already uh, uh, gained. And so that has fed through into this year. Then when we started this year, the Bank of Ghana published the FX forward um, issuance calendar or auction calendar and they indicated that for the first quarter of this year, the FX forward auctions will be allotting $50 million per biweekly auction. And after the first quarter, they will revert to $25 million allotment per biweekly auction. Now, one thing to note is that this allotment is higher than what will be happening after Q1 and is a recognition of the Bank of Ghana's commitment to currency stability in a typically difficult period for the Ghana city. This $50 million allotment is also $10 million more than the allotment they did in the first quarter of last year. Okay, so it showed that the market has actually seen that the Bank of Ghana has shown commitment to continue stability of the local currency. And to top of that is the inflows we are seeing from non-resident portfolio investors on the market. And that is actually supporting the local currency assets. Do we expect the stability to continue? 
yes, very confident of the stability continuing, largely because we trust in the Bank of Ghana's commitment to continued exchange rate stability. Now, stability, I would want to emphasize, is not the same as static. So it means that whilst we expect relative stability, we don't expect a static or fixed exchange rate. So there'll be movement up and down during the course of the, the year, depending on the forces of demand and supply. What we are confident about is the Bank of Ghana's commitment to ensure that there is no extreme uh, volatility or fluctuation in the currency. It will happen within a band that is very tolerable for business and investors. And over the last five years, we've seen that we've enjoyed currency depreciation that is below 10% in single digits. And so we are confident on the outlook on the city or for the city. On the impact of COVID, yes, the impact of, of COVID also happened on the informal sector. And as we showed in the early, early slides, um, the business tracker survey that was done by the Ghana Statistical Survey showed what happened to the informal sector, where there was job losses. 1.4% of the total workforce were laid off, and that's about 42,000 42, workers. And there was, there was also reduction in wages, over 25% of the workforce, translating into over 770,000 people also suffered reduction in their, in their wages. So the informal sector, I would say, was probably the hardest hit because it is the largest sector in the economy in terms of numbers of business and employer of labor. And also it is a sector that has the smallest economic uh, um, value. I mean, it contributes less than 30% to our total GDP. So it means that at the slightest shock, the informal sector is likely to suffer the most and they did suffer it the most. On um, the forecast for GDP, whether it included the 2020 figures, yes to some extent, because we don't have the full year 2020 GDP um, figures. We expect that to come somewhere in April but we have the first three quarters of last year, and that was factored into the projections. And we, we did not factor in the resurgence, but we believe that the range of 3.9% to 4.9% would capture the effect of the resurgence, moving the growth potentially away from the midpoint of 4.4% forecast for this year towards the lower band of 3.9% forecast for this year. On the balance of probability for inflation, I think very strongly that inflation is likely to end the year within the central bank target range of six to 10%, most likely in single digits. Now, there, there are risks to upside risks to the outlook. I mentioned earlier the recovery in oil price, the implication for export prices, transport fare, non-food inflation and headline inflation in that regard, the, the, the rollback of utility relief and the implication for utility tariffs. And, but it is also important to note that if you also take into account the base effect from last year, that in itself should pull down inflation. Then also the fact that currently aggregate demand is really subdued to the point that we are not seeing demand side pressure propelling price prices on the market. And for as long as wages and income levels have been contracted or reduced, the slowdown in demand means that even though there's a liquidity injection from the Bank of Ghana, it is not translating into demand pressures yet. And in the short term, we think demand will remain subdued. And so that means that inflation, at least for this term, should remain within the central bank's target range of six to 10%. And I believe that was Jesse, uh, Jeff. Yes, so, so that's basically it. There are a couple of other questions that, um, we, we have, but I think we will hold on to it for now. And then hopefully in the course of um, the day, if possible, we will share and then you would respond to it as well. All right, so thank you very much, Courage. We, we very much enjoy any time you do a presentation for us. We are very excited about it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, like I said, we would share the rest of the questions that Courage is not able to respond to. Um, in the course of the discussion or for tomorrow during our panel um, discussions as well. Now we'll move on to our next presenter and our next presentation would be on the topic or we'll be presenting on the topic mortgage debt securitization as a means of improving mortgage liquidity. 
Um, I'm sure you would agree that the issue of um, housing has been a big issue. And so we would want to have an expert in this field speak to us. Um, he is a former trader and a co-manager of the UBS Investment Bank, Delta One Trading Dex, where he helped to improve from 250 million billion um, dollars to a 60 billion, 250 million dollars to a 60 billion dollar asset under management. In 2011, of course, the desk incurred a 2.3 billion trading loss to the bank and to protect the bank and his colleagues, he took full responsibility for it. Um, and he, for that, he suffered a sentence. The British criminal justice and immigration system took a boot line on this and sentenced him to seven years in prison and deported him to Ghana thereafter. However, since his release from prison in June 2015, he has proven himself to be an accomplished and sought after keynote speaker. Now in Ghana, he is armed with unique understanding of global finance and is a staunch advocate for systems that prioritize the equitable distribution of proceeds of global economic endeavor, especially for Africa. He has helped to build, or he is helping to build a mortgage-backed bond refin refinancing marketplace for the Ghana property market. And if you don't find him in any of the boardrooms here in Accra, you would find him farming mangoes on his father's or family farm in Aveime in the Volta region of Ghana. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my singular honor to introduce, to speak on the topic mortgage debt securitization as a means of improving mortgage liquidity, Mr. Kweku Adoboli. Hi, Kweku, how are you? I'm very well, Jeff. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for having me and for that incredible introduction. Great. It's good to have you. And I am sure that our participants are excited to hear from you. So yes, I kindly take it away with your presentation. Thank you very much, Jeff. I hope to uh, impart something of, of use to, to your delegates. Um, bear with me one second while I try and share this screen. Um, I think my settings might be a problem here. And whilst we get people to set up this um, screen, I just want to encourage you again, ladies and gentlemen, that you can start putting down notes. And if you have any questions for him as well, you could share in the Q&A session, and then we would read it out to him to respond to. Um, this is going to be again a two day session and from today to tomorrow we will have a lot of speakers in the respective fields um, presenting to us. And so we encourage you to put down your questions and share with us on the platform so that our speakers can address it. Kweku, if you are ready, you can take it up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe you should be able to see my screen now. Um, just, yes, it's up now. Yes. Um, okay, so um, it's, as I said, it's a great honor to be here to speak about Ghana's uh, mortgage market um, place. Um, since I've been back, um, I've been looking at different areas of, of Ghana's economy in which I might be able to add some value. And uh, back in 20, uh, 2019, um, I was introduced to uh, two men, um, Michael and Kwanta Bisa and, um, and Kwame Daku, who've been working on um, building a mortgage-backed bond marketplace uh, for the Ghanaian economy. Um, and uh, over the last year or so, the work we've done together has, has, has shown me certainly that um, the solution that we are trying to put in place um, is one that will really help the Ghanaian economy um, and help to provide more mortgages, mortgages into our economy and help to um, start to close the gap um, on our housing deficit. Um, when, I, when, when I started looking at this and I was being taught um, the, the issues in the Ghanaian market, um, I was quickly, quickly learned that there are basically, obviously in any housing market, there are supply side and demand side constraints. Um, and that in Ghana, these constraints are actually quite steep. Um, on the supply side, a high cost of materials and land, um, 
uh, deep issues on line title validity um, and long-term funding constraints were the three big issues on the supply side. And on the demand side, um, obviously informal um, and irregular income, high cost of housing units, inability to meet mortgage payments, et cetera, and a lack of data. Um, but then again, this lack of access to long-term um, um, local currency funding came up again as a key problem. And of course, um, the solution in any situation where um, you have deep problems on both the supply and the demand side in housing, um, the natural tendency is for the participants to focus on the supply side. Because in focusing on the supply side, you're automatically creating um, collateral from the capital that you've, that you've invested, as opposed to on the demand side where you're deploying capital, but um, you have a house as collateral, but if there's no secondary market, it becomes very difficult to realize um, if anything should go wrong, your loan into a house that's an existing house. Um, so that has led in Ghana to a one-sided focus where um, every, all of the capital has been focused on um, housing supply. Um, but as you can see, there's a huge demand for houses in Ghana. Um, I think um, uh, for a 2014-2015 um, analysis on the uh, standard of living in Ghana showed that um, there were 2.5 million households that could afford a mortgage, um, but that there was um, also a, 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 a deficit um, of houses of about 100,000 per year increasing. Um, and the classic reasons that are often given for the lack of a mortgage market in Ghana is that, you know, Ghanaians lack a culture of credit or we're not responsible enough to manage, you know, long-term liabilities, um, that we live in multi-generational homes and therefore, um, young people are less likely to need to live in their own homes and old people are likely to live with their uh, younger children and therefore um, there is less stratification of the housing market. Um, you know, it's often said that banks simply lack the appetite to make mortgage loans because they don't want the long-term risk and that they make their profits generally from the transactions and therefore mortgages are not um, a, a great me me method for them to make money. It's often said also that Ghanaians prefer to build their own homes. They prefer to, to pay for them as they build them. They want their houses to be fully funded because they don't want the responsibility of a long-term debt. Um, and of course, um, on the system side, um, it's clear that um, we don't have very much in terms of credit analysis. I think it's probably fair to say we don't have any credit analysis systems on the ground, although they're being built and developed now. Um, and the reason we don't have them is because, you know, up, up until last year, um, we didn't really have a national addressing system. And a lot of the identification systems that were required, national ID systems were being put in place as well in the last few years. So in this case, that classic reason has been debunked because um, we are starting to see systems being put in place. Um, additionally, um, uh, in order for a mortgage marketplace to exist and to operate properly, um, there has to be an adoption of various employment, life and property insurance standards um, and products that allow uh, mortgage borrowers to be protected should something happen and they be unable to keep up with repayments. And that obviously protects the issuer as well. And of course, collateral management is impossible without adoption of quality and performance standards as well. So um, in a housing market where um, uh, uh, housing regulations or real estate regulations are not robust and in place, it can be very hard to standardize valuation of houses and therefore the loans that are given against them. So classics are re classic reasons are given for low mortgage origination. Um, in Ghana, uh, we, our analysis shows that there are a total of 9,000 mortgages roughly in the Ghanaian economy at an average of about $55,000 per mortgage. And therefore, um, uh, our analysis shows there's about $510 million worth of, of mortgages in the Ghanaian economy across all mortgage origination, originating banks. Um, the challenge, of course, there is that that represents only 0.75% of our GDP. And when compared to some um, other uh, marketplaces that we might choose to look at, um, you know, even Argentina has 5% of, um, uh, of, of mortgages represent 5% of its GDP. If we were to get to South Africa's levels, um, you know, at 35% of GDP, we really would be creating a powerhouse of, a, of an asset class in this economy. Um, obviously, you know, 5% of our GDP would create a mortgage market of about $3.5 billion, um, which um, 
uh, you know, just the securitization fees alone represents a huge opportunity for market members um, to generate some revenues from securitization. Um, but the reality, despite all the reasons that have been given, the classic reasons for why there is a very small or non-existent mortgage marketplace in Ghana, um, the true cause is that it's a structural problem. Right? Um, it's a problem that has arisen because all of the funding that we have sourced so far for mortgages in Ghana has been closed ended, it tends to come from development finance institutions um, and or uh, grants that are uh, acquired by various actors. Um, and of course, those are closed ended. So as soon as um, those funds are used up, um, they are no longer available um, for more mortgages and therefore new funds have to be sourced. Um, within the banks who are offering um, uh, mortgages, it's often that they, often that they offer their mortgages to the very high credit quality that um, their own employees represent. Um, and actually, so banks have offered mortgages to their employees, and so have other big employers like Vodafone, etc. Um, but again, because of an inability to refinance those mortgages, uh, those mortgages end up using a balance sheet, which the banks can then no longer redeploy. Um, which obviously um, is a, acts as a break on our economy. Um, and of course, the reality is that the reason why um, there is this gap is because there's a duration mismatch, right? So the banks pay out a lump sum at origination of the loan. Um, their balance sheet becomes drained immediately as liquidity is utilized. Um, and then over the course of the loan, they receive coupons back to replenish their balance sheet. On the other side of this equation, you've got pension funds who receive coupons, pension insurance companies receive coupons over their life to originate the investment asset. Um, their balance sheet grows as the coupons are received, creating investment supply, which they then need to deploy to generate returns for their investors. Now, um, and then at the end of that process, they pay out a lump sum, including the investment returns to their investor. Now, um, the issue here is that there is no mechanism for the banks and the pension funds to exchange their liabilities. The banks obviously would love to, 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 to refinance the mortgages on their balance sheet and move them to someone who's looking for a long-term asset, a long-term liability, sorry, um, uh, uh, to generate returns over a long period so that they can make new loans or, or make new, um, uh, make new uh, mortgages. Um, and, you know, just to speak philosophically, um, in the time I've spent in Ghana, one of the things that has struck me is how um, hard it is for young people to, um, to find jobs and to contribute to the economy in a, in, a, in a purposeful and creative way. And I think one of the reasons for it could be put down to the, the lack of liquidity as the, as the senior generations accrue their assets and their wealth um, and they're accrued and held inside property, um, such as their homes. Um, they're unable to uh, release that liquidity because of a lack of a secondary market, uh, because of a lack of bank balance sheet liquidity, even if they're ex excellent credit. Um, which means that if a young person goes to their senior and asks for help to, you know, uh, to pursue some sort of entrepreneurial activity, the elders are unable to support that. Now, if they had a mechanism by which they could release liquidity from their home, then they could invest in the junior generations and entrepreneurship would grow. Um, and so that is a function of a lack of a secondary market. But um, when we look at what pension, the role of a, pension, of a pension system in a society, ultimately it's a system that allows uh, the elder generations to invest in the younger generations who have less assets so that the younger generations can create growth, which the older generations can then rely on in their retirement. And in our economy, there is this fundamental structural flaw whereby um, the banks are stuck with the long-term liabilities because there's no mechanism to transfer them to the pension funds. And so we focused on how to fix that. This is not a massively innovative um, solution. I mean, the, the, these, these types of solutions have been put in place in Nigeria, in Tanzania. And ultimately, they are um, versions of mortgage marketplaces that exist in the West. Although um, in the design of this one, um, certain uh, pressure valves have been put in place to ensure that uh, the system cannot be allowed to overheat um, by maintaining credit risk at the originator of the loan. 
Um, but um, the key thing to note here is that um, in the previous model um, where um, we were requiring uh, funding to come in from DFIs, there was generally a large amount of currency risk and credit risk um, and liquidity risk that um, uh, that results because um, the DFIs could pull their funding or because of uh, 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 foreign exchange fluctuations, devaluation in the city, et cetera, which increases our debt burden and act as a break again on the economy. And the reality is that um, what we need to do is to be able to, um, to create a local currency um, uh, uh, asset base that acts as a support to the economy. And since all of our houses are in Ghana and are being financed by Ghanaian institutions, there's no reason why our housing uh, mortgage market should not be priced in CDs, which would create a large local currency base that would help us to, um, to, um, to, to bolster our economy. Um, and so with this model, where basically um, the home buyers come to the mortgage issuing banks, the mortgage issuing banks um, hold those mortgages for a period of time, three to nine months to prove their, perf their performance. And then they have the option to take a portfolio of those mortgages to a mortgage refinance company, which we've named Morico. And Morico would then um, uh, package those mortgages into a bond based on a set of rules, a set of standard rules, which would be issued to the issuing banks who are all uh, members of uh, the marketplace as license holders or equity holders of the company. And uh, those, uh, 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 those bonds that are created by Morico would then be sold on to either the pension funds or insurance companies, or indeed any other investors who wanted to invest in an asset class that's slightly higher risk than government paper, with a premium of three or 4% above government paper. But because of the structure of this bond where it's basically a covered bond where if a non-performing loan, if one of the loans in the bond starts to become non-performing, it needs to be swapped out by the original uh, originating bank. And they can swap it and put in a new performing mortgage or they can replace it with government paper. And because the default position is government paper, Ultimately, the security um, uh, is 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 is, um, is very close to government risk. Um, but that's how we've tried to structure it. And the idea then is that um, this allows for um, in, uh, pension pension funds, etc., who uh, who want slightly higher risk to risk appetite, but um, not to give it all to, to to government paper, can diversify to the private sector in this way. Um, I've kind of described this already, but this is kind of how it works. Um, but um, just to discuss why um, this is such an important um, initiative, what we believe it's such an important initiative. Um, you know, um, de 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 delivering a, market, a mortgage bond marketplace um, allows us to focus on developing the entire um, uh, 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 property ecosystem. So from the developers all the way through to the real estate agents, everybody is a stakeholder in this marketplace because they all help to determine the standard of the marketplace, right? So we have to develop mortgage insurance programs, common standards for underwriting, documentation, credit assessment, you know, regular activities of real estate agents, introduce building codes, provide protection for buyers and sellers of houses. Effectively, what we're doing is we're creating, by creating this mechanism that requires these standards to be hit, we're creating all the other activities, we're, 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 we're encouraging all the other activities to be, to be undertaken as well, creating jobs and creating um, uh, uh, prosperity for, for, for young Ghanaians who will um, come into this marketplace, we believe. Um, and, and then, of course, we've talked about the duration gap, but there's these social order benefits of a mortgage-backed bond marketplace. Um, you know, the first being the duration gap. And, and you know, since, since 2008, um, when, when, when the new pension laws have come in, which have been brilliant for, for helping the evolution of the Ghanaian financial ecosystem, um, this one solution, this one tool has not yet been put in place. And we think that it will be a big bonus to the pensions um, uh, ecosystem. Um, but more importantly, it encourages deep collaboration between all stake stakeholders. And, and this idea that we need to encourage 
collaboration is one that's very close to my heart. Like one thing that I've struggled with in Ghana is, is this idea around price discovery. In every transaction in Ghana, nobody really knows what the right price is. So there's a conversation, a negotiation that is had every single time about price in every transaction. And of course, in the resolution of that, trans of that, of that negotiation about price, inevitably there's one party who feels that they have basically given too much and one party who may feel that they've gained a lot in that negotiation primarily because they don't have transparency on price. So they don't really know whether or not they've done well on that price. Um, and I think that creating this, um, this marketplace is another tool that encourages transparency and price discovery, which allows for improvement of trust and collaboration between the native business entities. And of course, then reduces competition and conflict, which also, I mean, competition is good, but not in excess, which also increases uh, add, va add value to the to the to the local economy. Um, ultimately, uh, you know the Ghanaian pension pot is growing um, as um, as the government uh, government's ability to prove to prove its revenue generation capabilities grows, um, and of course that means that uh, you as pension funds you need to have. Um, alternative investment um, opportunities. Um, we think that the value, the potential full value, if you were to um, to to realize 2.5 million mortgages in Ghana, either through new originations or uh, secondary market sales, um, you know, total potential market size of 137 billion, based on 2014 numbers, that's in dollars. You know the likelihood of, um, of of writing loans against the full balance obviously is not realistic. But as a start, even if we just write three billion dollars worth of mortgages in the next three, four, five years, that's thirty-five million dollars of revenue to the company. Um, but it's a huge six-fold increase in the total size of Ghana's mortgage marketplace, which um, would be um, a remarkable achievement um, should we get there. And, and we believe that should all market players uh, join in um, and, and, and become stakeholders with skin in the game, then they also um, uh, would benefit from the revenue opportunity of, uh, of securitization, but more importantly, they would be benefiting from the growth in Ghana's mortgage, place, mortgage marketplace generally. Um, I've kept it simple. Um, I am now open to any questions you might have. Um, uh, 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 ab about about the mobile marketplace. Thank you very much. Quick, we thank you. Um, we will invite questions. If there are any questions, you can kindly put them up in our chat area. And I noticed a couple of them have come in, and so I'll just um, run them by you to see uh, what your response is. I think there's a first one, which is just um, an opinion. So maybe you can you can share um, if you agree. And it's from Susie. Susie is saying that our market lacks innovation. We know, we know why we are not growing unless we can creatively break this barrier with an early support by the regulator who will keep singing the same song. Um, I think that's just a thought. I don't know if you would agree or disagree that yeah. we lack innovation. I, I, I completely agree with Dr. Susie. I think that um, you know, uh, this, this question of creativity and innovation generally is one that we really need to focus our minds on. Um, from my experience, it's an issue with the culture in which we, in which, in the culture in which we address problems and the way in which we um, deal with failure and mistakes from a very young age. And we have to teach young people to be more innovative um, and, and to use their initiative. But at a higher level uh, on this, on mortgage-backed bonds, we really need the, the regulators, um, that's the Bank of Ghana, the Ministry of Finance and the SEC um, to come on board um, and basically um, set the direction of travel for us by sanctioning or approving our license and then encouraging other stakeholders to join in. And, and I think that if we do that, then everyone can be a stakeholder and we can very quickly, I mean, when you, you see a lot of problems in Ghana and you realize that you know, very quickly they can be solved. Every now and then someone will come along with a really innovative solution and all of a sudden a problem that seemed completely in, intractable actually turns out to be relatively easy to, relatively easy to fix, relatively low hanging fruit. We just need to focus a bit deeper on, on creativity and innovation. Um, so I agree with Dr. Susie there. 
Okay. Okay. Beneza also wants to find out from you that how do we ensure that over time, this derivative bond do not spiral out of control in a manner similar to that of the subprime mortgage crisis? Should this be a matter of concern? It, it should be, and it is one that's been close to our heart, has been close to the heart um, while we've been developing the solution. Um, we think the key is to maintain credit risk at the originating bank. Um, that acts as a control on behavior and um, should, um, you know, if, if you know you can't parcel off this bond when it becomes non-performing and, sorry, this mortgage into a bond when it's not performing, you know you're going to have to take it back if it becomes non-performing. That should encourage you to, uh, to create a, a pricing structure that maintains its performance because um, otherwise you're going to end up with the credit risk anyway um, and, and the default. And we think that that should um, act as a control. Um, you know, obviously, this 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 can become a um, a macro prudential tool tool for the Bank of Ghana. Um, they can speed and slow down the economy by buying or selling more of these types of bonds. Um, and, and so, of course, if you know the economy does start to overheat, there is that macro prudential solution um, opportunity for the Bank of Ghana and other regulators other regulators to 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 encourage selling of these bonds or or, or closing down of these bonds in order to unwind some of, some of the excess um, if, if, if overheating, if it's there. Okay, um, there's another question from Matthew and he wants to find out from you, how is this uh, mortgage refinancing company going to be funded? Um, so, um, so we are ultimately, um, initial funding will come from DFIs. Um, we've the funding level at the beginning is relatively low. We, we think it's about $140 million, um, something like that. Um, and then equity um, holders um, from all the stakeholders um, buying equity in the company um, for day-to-day, uh, -to, -day to finance day-to-day -day operations. Um, and um, uh, over time, obviously, as um, the market size grows, um, it would then, obviously, the, the debt financing would uh, roll off the DFI debt financing would roll off, and you would replace it with local funds. Okay. Um, there's a question also from uh, Norbert. Uh, Norbert says, "Thank very much for the presentation. My name is Norbert from Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, my question is, what can be ex what can be the expected return for pension funds for this asset class?" What can yeah. be the expected response? Um, an analysis was done in Nigeria by the World Bank, um, and they were looking at kind of three or four percent above the bank rate. Um, it seems sensible um, for Ghana as well. I, you know, I, I don't think it should be more than three or four percent above that because, um, because ultimately, if any of the loans become non-performing, they can be, they, they have to be replaced, and the default is government paper. So. Um, we don't think it should be much higher than, you know, three or four percent above um, the Ghana, uh, the, the city, the city, city rate. Okay. Um, Isaac also wants to find out, and he says, thanks for the detailed presentation and short presentation. What advice do you have for an investor who currently is, wants to enter the real estate industry as far as mortgage is concerned? It's really difficult at the moment to enter the, the mortgage space because, I mean, ultimately it's, it's hard to find good credit. It's hard to understand good credit. The banks have basically sewn up all the good credit by um, offering mortgages to their employees um, and also the likes of Vodafone. And um, uh, so now um, uh, additional credit uh, requires um, at the moment, without this tool, uh, without um, a refinancing mortgage marketplace, requires you to go and find funds. Um, and so, you know, you might try and find some funds from uh, developed markets like the U.S., where there are a number of um, diaspora who may have access to U.S. funds that they may be allowed to invest in Ghana. Um, you know, there are, there, are, there are people that are looking at that kind of solution. But it's very difficult. Um, you know, lending standards have been have been tight outside of developing countries, so out of the developed countries. Um, um, so it's been hard to deploy capital. Um, during, during, you know, we've seen during COVID how hard it's 
been to deploy capital into Ghana um, and into Africa generally, or into basically black spaces. Um, but um, you know, that's kind of where you have to focus is finding the funds. And I would look, I would be looking um, to develop markets for that. Okay. Um, um, Simon also wants to find out from you. Um, what would be the what would be the target interest rate range that would work for massive mortgage? Um, he says that the current interest rate is, is not suitable for most Ghanaians because it's ranging around 20% and it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, the government initiative um, for public sector workers um, where they subsidize mortgages down to about 12% um, is probably close to where it needs to be. Um, of course, it's unsustainable, um, but um, if we can find the ability to, um, to um, basically um, uh, suppress housing interest rates, but then maintain the performance of those loans, the hope is that the overall borrow rate would drop, right? So if um, a tool like this hopefully would um, help to reduce yields um, by um, creating another upside pressure um, on, on bonds. But um, in terms of a range, it's very difficult to say, right? Like where it needs to be is around sort of 8 to 14, 8 to 13% to be affordable. Anything more than 15 to, you know, 15% becomes really difficult, right? Once you get to, you know, 20%, 25%, the value of the house has to be doubling every three years for it to be, um, to be worth it. So it's, or four years. So it's, it's kind of like, um, you, you, we really need to get mortgage rates down, um, or we have to keep housing the, the you know we have to keep the cost of housing super low so that the term of the loan can be very short. So you know the challenge is you need to bring down the price of affordable housing to about you know 30, 40, 30, 25, 30 thousand dollars per unit so that you know even if it is um, paid up, paid off over five years, six years at 25 percent, it's not you know it's not going to you know break anyone or still will, but not too much. Um, or the alternative is the government needs to enter the space, continue to subsidize where it can until the market rate falls to the subsidized rate based on continuing performance. That's kind of how I would, how I, I would approach it, but it's a tough one because we don't know, um, we, don't re we can only model, we don't know for exact how, how the market will respond. Okay, um, Yolanda wants, um, she actually has two questions, wants to know um, that you mentioned credit risk and liquidity risk. Do you also see market risk playing a role in this space as well? That's the first question. The second question is, since we know Ghanaians do not take long-term debt, which is understandable because of high unemployment, um, is there a way where you tweak your product to factor in the risk of unemployment as well? Yeah, so um, the product, so obviously um, the mortgage, um, the originating mortgage, which was issued by the bank, um, should have protections against unemployment factored in. So there should be unemployment insurance as a, as a product tagged onto that mortgage. So when the mortgage becomes non-performing, the bank would be under obligation to swap it out of the bond and give us something else that was performing. So that's kind of how we've tried to take into account unemployment. Um, of course, I hear you that Ghanaians don't like to take mortgage debt because you know, there's this uncertainty um, over mortgages. Um, we're hoping that the insurance products which are being developed would um, factor for that, that, um, that, that, that risk. Um, there, is, um, there is market risk playing a role in this space. Um, as I said earlier, you know, we do believe that this is a macro prudential or it can be used as a macro prudential tool should the regulator choose to. Um, and of course, that means that it has a market effect, right? If they were to want to, um, you know, uh, put pressure on yields um, to reduce yields or slow down, slow down the market um, or slow down the economy, they could do that using these tools by instructing purchasing of these um, uh, uh, Delta One type assets. Now, um, which obviously means that it's also open to manipulation or market risk from outsiders as well. Um, but the reality is we think that, you know, pricing these in CDs locally means that, um, that the, the market risk is in line with 
government bonds in the city space. Um, so we don't believe that there's any reason, again, because it's underpinned ultimately by government paper, we don't believe that there's an excess market risk over, over and above any of the other assets that are currently trading in Ghana. Okay, now th there's a very, I think a straightforward question and um, it's an, from an anonymous person. He says, can we have a thriving mortgage market despite our high interest rate regime? Is it possible? Um, so again, you know, interest rates are not fixed. Um, it's not possible. I mean, ultimately the game here is to reduce interest rates. Um, you know, ultimately we need to get to where Argentina is um, despite their multiple defaults. Um, uh, and, and when we do that, there will be a natural increase in mortgage loans anyway. What we're saying is that this tool is a necessary part of that process in reducing rates because it, it increases the ability of the Ghanaian economy to generate its own balance sheet. Um, and it also, it, you know, by collateralizing property on the ground, um, but it, you know, it reduces the pressure to seek funds from outside um, and, and it increases the, the, the local currency um, deposit base, which we think are all good things and would lead to a reduction in the interest rates, the overall interest rates in the economy. Um, and so uh, that's, you know, there's a chicken and egg thing here, um, but as a structural impediment, not having this type of tool in place holds us back. Okay. Um, Daniel wants to find out, he says that mortgage back security takes my mind back to the 20, 2008 banking crisis. And he says that your solution to non-performing loans is to swap um, out bad loans with government paper. What incentive would the mortgage originators have to swap out those bad loans? What incentive would the mortgage originators have to swap bad loans? They're contractually bound um, to swap out those bad loans. Um, if they don't uh, agree to that as a, as, a term, as, a, as a term of engagement, then they can't be a part of the marketplace and they won't have the benefit of being able to um, refinance their balance sheets. Remember, if a bank is sitting there with, you know, 200 million or, yeah, there is a bank sitting there with about $200 million worth of, of mortgages on its book. If a bank is sitting there with $200 million of mortgages on its book, it has to find a way to refinance them. If someone comes along and says, here, you can refinance your mortgages if you use this system, but you have to follow this set of rules, the incentive is in following the rules in order to have access to that marketplace. As soon as you stop following those rules, you no longer have access. So we think that um, you know, everybody understands why we've put this in. We've put it in as, as, as precisely for this reason, because we all remember 2007, 2008, and we need to make sure that we, we do not put that, you know, especially in a country where the, the fear of credit is so, is so high, um, it, it's, it's important that we, we put in safeguards and, 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 and pressure valves that would protect, to protect the economy. Okay. So um, we have tons of questions coming in and I'm excited about the questions that are coming in for, for Kweku, but um, we, need to take, we need to take the next presentation, which is probably gonna be a good one. So I'm just gonna end up with maybe this very one from Kwabena and then um, certainly um, participants who would have um, Kweku be, be with us tomorrow. Tomorrow is a full day panel discussion for Q and A's and so we'll be able to address most of your questions then. So Kweku, maybe just before you leave, um, a last question from Kabna, and he says that, um, would you agree that the lack of this security on our market has more to do with housing affordability than the balance sheet liquidity? How do we address that? Um, it's a great question. Um, again, it's a bit of a chicken and egg. I'm, I'm personally, um, uh, I think that the existing mortgages uh, on Ghana's balance, on, 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 on our books, uh, are about $510 million. So have a, half a billion dollars worth of mortgages on our books. I'm pretty certain, given the opportunity, our banks would happily create $500 million worth of balance sheet um, if they could. Um, they just can't, uh, you know? So I, they, I, I, I think they really can't, right? They have to go and 
ask someone to give them, you know, World Bank or IFC or someone to give them 100 million, 200 million dollars. So that's, you know, that's really, um, you know, so the lack of the security on the market, you know, is that because of housing affordability or balance sheet liquidity? I mean, I would, if I was a bank, I would be looking for a way to get, to get rid of this, this balance sheet, right? Um, so, and then since $500 million worth of mortgages are on the books, and um, the standard of living assessment in 2015 showed that two and a half million Ghanaians could afford, so two and a half million households could afford a mortgage at these rates, at the rates in 2014, or you know, 25, 30% it was back then. It, you know, so even then the analysis said that a large number of Ghanaian households could afford mortgages. So um, I'm pretty sure again, that the banks would be happy to finance that and the economy would benefit from that balance sheet um, liquidity being, being released. Um, so I, you know, to answer your question, it's still hard to answer, um, but I think that um, the lack of the security, um, it's just more to do with the fact that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be developed and it's being developed in a very short period of time with very little resource, to be honest. If you look at the, the things that are being done in Ghana with, and, and, and what it's, be, what, you know, the resources that are being found to do them, it's incredible, you know, payment systems, um, uh, uh, credit checking, credit rating systems, local companies, outside companies, lots and lots of people looking at every, le every level of the society trying to, trying to implement these solutions. I just think it's a matter of time. We've not had the bandwidth until since, you know, the mid 2000s, 2006, seven and eight, when we had this huge push on, on property, we've not had the bandwidth to put this system in place. We couldn't have put the system in place before we had a push on, on, on the property growth we've seen since 2007, 2008. And so therefore, it's kind of like, it's just the time because we've now reached the point where we've shown that there is a mortgage market in Ghana, as small as it is, but there is a block on it. And the block is that there is no mechanism for the banks to easily in an open-ended fashion, refinance their balance sheets. And there's no mechanism in an open-ended fashion for the pension companies to invest in the bank's balance sheets or the asset that's on the, bank, the bank's balance sheets, which is the, the homes. So it just hasn't been built yet. And I think it's a matter of time rather than anything else. Um, and I think the time is now. Great, the time certainly is now. I'll just end with a comment from Eric. And Eric says that, that he worked with a mortgage-backed security, which, is, which has a similar structure to what you have just presented with a local bank. But they found out that uh, pension funds were unwilling to take up long, longer paper due to tenor and currency. In the short term, the USD paper underperforms the local currency bonds and pension trustees are less comfortable with long duration. And, and Eric is saying that I hope that after your presentation, more fund managers will see the benefits of long-term investments. So somebody is agreeing with you on that as well. I'm very grateful for that comment from Eric. You know, obviously he really knows what he's talking about. So um, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's very encouraging to hear that. And I, I do hope the message gets out there. Because, you know, this is one of those weird things where it's like, it's actually low hanging fruit. If we just build it, crazy things start to happen very quickly. Not crazy, crazy good things start to happen very quickly. Um, but you just have to build these things and there's lots and lots of them, these low hanging fruits that we just you know, target them, get them hit and then move on. Um, and I think, I think Eric is right there. Um, hopefully once we implement it, people start to see the benefit. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much our participants. Thank you very much Peku. We are most grateful for your presentation. We have a lot of questions for you people, but um, mm -hmm. obviously we can't take all of them because um, we are virtual and so people would probably fatigue might set in. Mm -hmm. And so what I would encourage everybody is that um, Peku will be also available tomorrow for our Q&A session panel discussion. And the questions that we are not able to take now or the questions we are not able to for him to address now, we can read it out to him tomorrow so that he, tomorrow is supposed to be a very, very interactive session with a panel discussion. And so we certainly will keep your questions for tomorrow and I'm sure you'll be available to respond to all of them. Definitely, I look forward to it. Great, thank you very much for that presentation. We are very excited about it. And I think it begins a very good 
line of conversation among trustees and fund managers. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to continue with the next presentation, which has to do on, on the topic, exploring real estate opportunities, either through direct investment or through a real estate vehicle. Um, to speak to this topic is a gentleman who has over 20 years experience in the real estate um, industry. He has practiced in areas relating to real estate asset management, landlord and tenant work, development appraisal and corporate real estate advice. He has a portfolio of clients that include pension funds, corporate and high network, private investors and local authorities. He has worked with his current job since 2012. He started as, off as a portfolio asset manager and has risen to um, his current position. Um, he currently is responsible, or he is actually the chief executive officer of Bro Ghana, which is a, um, uh, a household name for most of us, I'm sure we are very familiar with. I'm happy to present to you uh, Mr. Tony Sechi to speak with us on the topic, exploring real estate opportunities, either through direct investment or through real estate vehicles. Hello, Tony. Hello, Jeff. Hi, Tony, how are you? I am very well, thank you. And uh, thank you for the uh, very nice introduction. And a good morning to Great. the um, participants. And I'm hoping that today we can give them a, a good presentation. OK. Um, Great. So we have a lot of participants who are eager to listen to you. So please take it away, and then you take your questions afterwards. OK. And I hope I'm able to share screen um, at some point during the presentation. Certainly, yes. Yeah. All right. Um, as um, Jeff said, uh, well, Broad Ghana is uh, supposed to be a household name, but for the purpose of those of us who are not too familiar with Broad, we're a property services consultancy um, as part of the um, Broad Property Group based in South Africa. Um, we have uh, 17, um, or a footprint in 17 countries in the whole of Africa, offering valuation and advisory services, corporate real estate brokerage in the residential and uh, commercial and industrial sectors. Um, and of course, offering property management and facilities management service as well. So we have the whole spectrum of services in the real estate industry. So once again, thank you to Access Pension for giving us the opportunity to um, get some form of information on the real estate market in particular to do with long-term investment options um, in the Ghanaian market. Um, we're hoping today that our presentation will give an introduction to uh, real estate as an asset and also give an overview of the Ghanaian real estate market, the trends that we have been through lately, and um, also give an insight to investment options available in the Ghanaian market at the moment, both direct and indirect. But we'll be focusing a lot on the indirect aspect since that is basically what is the untapped aspect of uh, real estate investment. And um, for those, um, the two main ones being um, real estate in investment trusts and um, mortgage-backed securities, which um, my colleague presenter has so eloquently given us um, a proper insight into. So if I may um, share screen now, okay. Okay, there we go. Um, I hope everyone, everyone can see the shared screen. Yes, we can see that. Okay, brilliant, okay. All right, so um, by way of introduction, real estate as an asset, is essentially a physical asset that um, produces um, income and has been seen throughout the investment world as one of the most or the safest forms of investment, providing quite high returns and um, some very good, um, I'll say, safe safety in terms of um, risks. 
However, its, it's key characteristics basically is that it has um, a longer holding period, um, not exactly easily divisible into parts and less liquid compared with other financial um, assets. From the Ghanaian market perspective, um, the real estate sector surprisingly has um, contributed or is steadily contributing quite a, a chunk uh, by way of sector contribution to the GDP of Ghana. From 2015 at 7.7%, we have steadily been increasing GDP contribution up to 19.9% in um, 2019. Um, in 2020, there was a sector um, contraction, primarily, as we all know, because of uh, the lack of activity or lack of transactional activity in um, 2020 because of the, the, the COVID advent of COVID. But we can see that it has to, throughout the, towards the third quarter of 2020, that rebound and uh, we are now at a 17.1%. Um, now, in the terms of the, the players in the real estate market, it's primarily private sector with um, our government and prior status participation quite minimal. Uh, lately, we have seen um, public private partnerships in the development of affordable housing units, which is meant to address the, um, the, 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 the housing deficit that we are often hearing about. And, um, even though it is not, it has not given much impact. We it is now gaining a little bit of traction, but as Kweku um, shared earlier on, one of the biggest barriers to this affordable housing issue is to do with cost and um, lack of credit and affordability is, is such a big issue. So it actually begs the question with respect to why it's even called affordable in the first place. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, within the real estate sector in Ghana, we're split mainly into residential and commercial. Residential essentially um, encompassing dwelling units but flowing from low-end compound houses and single dwelling units through to apartment buildings and, <clears throat> excuse me, and condominiums. And, and apartments that we often see in the um, high-end areas. For the commercial sector, we're looking at office properties, retail, which is um, Western style malls and shops. We also, um, for the industrial sector, which is mainly how warehousing in Ghana, and we also have the hotels and purpose built student housing and land. Now, hotels we and, and student housing, we often see as a kind of specialized area. So, in terms of uh, for the purpose of this, we will not delve um, too much into um, the um, hotel and uh, purpose-built student housing, even though I must say that there are several um, opportunities with respect to student housing that is available, but it is something that we probably can delve into at some point, either in this presentation or maybe in a, we can treat it differently as uh, on its own as an investment class. Hello, Tony. Yes. Sorry to disrupt you a bit. Um, I, if you could kindly um, put your presentation in a slide slideshow mode, so we can mm -hmm. see uh, the font size is a bit too small. So, right. in the okay. current stage, we are not able to see a full screen. Okay, is that better? Uh, no, I think you click. You should click the the very last option yeah. to your right. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Okay, this is perfect. Is that is that okay now? Yes, it's great. Okay, all right. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so now moving into um, the residential property segment. The residential property, surprisingly, despite all the big ticket items we see happening on the commercial sector with all the malls and everything, residential sector constitutes the largest um, segment, basically having about 80% of the market in Ghana with um, in excess of 100,000 transactions um, since 2015. 
Um, despite this, um, it, it, we will realize that it hasn't really attracted that much of um, institutional investment. And the bigger players within the residential market is mainly um, private individuals um, who mostly are high net worth individuals who uh, have bought into real estate for investment purposes and um, have put it on the market both for, for, for rental and then capital gains. Um, even though, as I said earlier, we have still have a trend of um, an increase in housing de de deficit, investment into this aspect has been quite low. And government has made all the noises in the past when um, talking about how to solve this affordable housing provision, but it still hasn't happened. And there is um, a death of investment in this area that needs um, to be tapped. For the commercial property segments, um, we, the, the, the stock of office space has considerably increased up to about 2018 when um, we virtually hit the supply peak. Just to give a bit of background on the um, grade A office development, in 2011, um, when we, the Ghana discovered oil, or oil production actually started, then we, uh, the uh, production of office, or I'll say development of grade A office space really accelerated. And at the time, due to the nature of office development or such um, big ticket office developments, the slowness of it, sometimes the concept from concept to actual development taking in excess of about three years. Um, supply was constricted and rents at that time between 2011 and 2013 peaked in basically the grade A office areas. And we could um, we're experiencing as high as $45 per square meter up to even $50 per square meter in the um, high end nodes such as airport city and, 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 and rich. And that was when we had the peak of grade A office um, developments. With time that slowed down when the development pipeline started to come on stream. And therefore we, after 2015 and 2016, we realized that rents were beginning to get depressed, um, obviously owing to the supply coming on stream. And then secondly, because we actually crept into an election cycle at the time, and which naturally usually depresses economic activity. And uh, also we went into a period where all the oil prices were going down, which affected that industry, which had in itself built up or accelerated the development in the, in the, in the office sector. Now, at this stage, we are seeing quite a, I'd, I'd say, a, a quite a glut of office space in the, in, the, in, in the environment. But there are certain concepts which have come on board, which we believe will be um, the driver for the revival, which is the serviced office concept. Again, this is an, a, a phenomenon that was gradually, gradually creeping into the market and it was taking root. But with the advent of COVID, this has accelerated the need or the requirement for flexible office spaces whereby people do not have a permanent space but just quick, um, can get into an office space um, as and when they need to. And it is something that it, the, the industry is now um, picking up and will be a phenomenon going forward. The retail um, segment in the commercial property side uh, basically entails um, Western style malls and then informal um, retail spaces. By informal retail space, we mean um, high street shop fronts, which has now be uh, it's now still an increasing trend. You may agree with me that if you look around today, you're walking through Laboni and um, um, East Legon on Lagos Avenue, you see that most of these roads, the houses on these roads, uh, the houses uh, facing the high street has been converted into retail outlet, outlets. And that tells you the importance of retail in the, um, current, uh, in the current real estate space. For Western style malls, such as Accra Mall, West Hills Mall, Marina Mall, ANC, these um, popped into the market from 27 onwards when Accra Mall was built. And then from then on, there we, have, we have had several coming into the market, actually expanding into our secondary cities like Takorade and Kumasi. And we believe that this is something that has come to stay by way of um, a phenomenon on the, on the real estate market. 
The industrial side, um, which hitherto has been relatively less vibrant, I must say is now um, picking up due mainly to um, the, uh, this, um, I would say the movement towards online retailing, which has led to most of the retailers demanding storage space such that they can actually have a distribution point for um, such uh, an industry practice. It was moving gradually and it formed just about 10 to say 15% of the total sales for most of our retailers. But once again, COVID coming in has changed the whole landscape with respect to um, the behavior of consumers. Restrictions obviously mean that people are unable to visit shops as they want to and um, online retailing and deliveries are now the, the thing or the, uh, the, the phenomenon that everyone else is following. So we see that the industrial market space will, is really going to um, take root and uh, the, the going forward, the demand for such space will, will, will increase. We've seen um, some development in such in this sector um, in some very good areas, including the Dawa Industrial Park. Traditionally, we've had the Tema Industrial Area and the Free Zone Area with warehouse space, but there is now development going on. And um, there's a company called Agility now developing some very um, modern um, warehouse space that can be used um, for this purpose. So we feel that industrial space um, is gradually moving into the future um, of, 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 of the real estate sector. Now, talking about all these um, uh, asset classes, I would say, um, both industrial, residential, commercial, and retail, um, the spread, or oh, sorry, the, um, the page I have on board at the moment gives us the average yields for each uh, market segment. Industrial, as I said, um, kind of leads the pack now with yields in the region of 11.5%, whilst residential um, has steadily given us 10%. Commercial um, has come down. It used to be one of our high yielding sectors, and by commercial, I mean office space, which is now operating in the region of 8.5% to 10%. Retail, again, um, was high performing, but the Western style malls now, because of um, dwindling demand or say stable demand is operating by way of yield in the region of eight to 12%. As you can see from here, the market indicators are showing that prime asking rents are being reduced at this stage where um, the asking rents as opposed to the net achieving rents um, there's quite a bit of variance in there in the region of about 10 to 15 percent. Um, if I look at residential, at first we used to command in the region of about 4,000 to 5,000 dollars for a typical three bedroom house or flat. Now that is reduced and operating in the range of about 1,500 to 2,500 or upwards of that depending on the offer. Um, the vacancy rates for um, uh, residential end by way of rentals is quite high, or it is high due primarily to increased supply. And as you can see, there is quite a substantial supply in the market at the moment because um, we still have developers producing or developing high end, quite speculatively hoping that the market will rebound and therefore they will be in a position to take advantage of uh, pent up demand as well. So we feel that, again, there, 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 the, the, the contraction in activity due to COVID has um, stabilized the market in a certain way. And there is pent up demand, which the developers are hoping that well, they, they will be able to take advantage of. Um, the office um, side um, has also experienced a slight downward trend in um, asking rents and even um, achieved rents, where we can see um, the demand being stable and supply as well being stable because of the, um, I would say the, 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 the supply side or developments which have slowed down considerably. Industrial, as I said, is where we do have um, very good indicators. Um, the asking, the difference between asking rents and achieving rents are, is quite low. And um, even though there is quite a high vacancy rate, I believe that is basically due to the secondary end of the market where these are this is old stock 
that have already been in the market, but there is a good demand for the modern stock that is now required by most modern um, real, um, sorry, retailers. So again, supply is up by way of uh, modern developments uh, upcoming. For the retail side, uh, um, asking rents, which used to be at the very top, is now really now coming down primarily because of um, lack of trading volumes. Obviously, we know what has happened in the past year, and it ha which has really put pressure on um, trade uh, on, on 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 demand for certain goods and services, and attendance to these malls footfalls are coming down. Um, the vacancy rate has not been too bad. It's 15% uh, across board, in our opinion. But um, that is basically due to the fact that for the past two years, we haven't had that many um, developments or that new projects coming on board. So supply has stabilized, even though we see that most speculative developments are now cranking up or seeking to come on board once again, hoping that there will be a, um, a rebound in the market going forward. Now, given this, um, all these uh, background to um, commercial real estate now, now opens up how uh, an investor can have a look in or will be able to invest in these real estate classes. And that will now lead us to what forms of investment types are available for some of these um, assets that we, we have already spoken about with respect to whether or not residential um, in the commercial side, whether it's office space or um, the industrial or retail. In Ghana, we have basically had two investor types and this is um, individual investors, which I spoke about earlier, mainly operating in the residential space made up of high net worth individuals who are buying direct um, investment by direct. And we mean that actually looking at buying the asset itself as it stands on the land. And um, we also have some institutional investors playing in the market who um, consist of pension funds such as SNIT, who traditionally um, I would say have been much involved in the um, real estate space, both across the spectrum, both in um, industrial, um, residential mostly. In fact, you know, I must say that SNIT, in fact, where the has been an institution that has had the most input in um, public housing. And then we also have some other fund manager or insurance companies as well who have um, doubled in real estate, which basically involves just um, development and buying and selling. And there are some investment companies as well, local investment companies, that are into um, developing and sale or rental of uh, real estate investment. So from the foregoing, we all kind of know or have a fair idea of what direct investment in real estate looks like, where you just provide the capital funding for investing in a real estate without using investment vehicles. Now the indirect investment, which is the most interesting aspect, and I would say the untapped aspect of um, real estate um, investment is where um, our attention would be most directed um, today. Now, it basically involves um, just putting together um, investment vehicles, which is usually by way of setting up a trust or um, just setting up such that that vehicle owns the real estate asset. And then the investors will go in or by way of acquiring shares or bonds of these um, vehicles, that's the, the way in which they will um, be able to, to invest in it. So as we can see, the basic, one of the basic investment types, direct, indirect investment types um, has been um, real estate investment trust and uh, mortgage backed securities. Um, one that Kweku has um, already dealt with and therefore we will concentrate um, on how the real estate investment trust normally operates. And by way of operation, as you can see, um, a REIT is set up, which is the trust is set up as a vehicle. It goes into the capital market, raises finance, and then with that finance, it usually would acquire or develop the properties. 
And I must say that most of what the REIT does is um, essentially um, they're able to look at various um, asset classes, which pull, get pulled into um, the trust. After development or the acquisition, that REIT will lease out and uh, manage these properties. And then for their various investors, the rental income is directly paid as dividends to the investors that are putting money in this trust. And these investors receive them, that is how they receive returns on their investments. The investors will normally not be involved in portfolio management. So you're free to just watch your investment grow. And um, mostly um, these, that is where most of the institutional investors are able to now um, look at a proper um, risk management asset and then uh, be able to um, have put money in. So from the shareholders perspective, it constitutes a very low risk way to invest in property. And there has been um, several ways in which um, REITs have been set up. Um, generally, the REITs is, you will usually have a board of directors or trustees by way of constitution. And it must have um, 100 shareholders as a, at, at the very minimum. And then uh, no more than 50% of its share should be held by um, five or fewer individuals within a certain taxable year. And then the REITs should have 75% of its total investments in real estate. And then the good thing here, which I believe is a very good thing, is that 90% of its income, which is by way of rent for each accounting year, should be paid as dividend to shareholders. You may agree with me that um, from the company perspective or usual limited liability company, um, dividend is usually paid at the behest of, uh, of the board or as and when profits or how profits are declared. But this is actually enshrined in law that 90% of this income should be paid out as dividends. And then um, the last one is that the REIT must derive 75% of its income from rents or other income form in its real estate assets. Now REITs in Ghana have had um, quite a, I would say, a patchy start as far back as 2005 or earlier than that, um, there was an attempt by the then home finance company, which has now, uh, which metamorphosed into HFC Bank and lately um, now known as Republic Bank. They set up uh, something called um, the HFC Unit Trust. And the aim was to gather funds and then to, to develop and then houses. Um, for its clients, and by clients, I mean the, its investors that had put funds into um, it. Originally, I think it was, um, there, there, was a, there was an institutionally led um, initiative uh, with SNET also playing a huge part in setting up this um, HFC Real Estate Investment Trust. But it's been a non-starter because it actually has ended up more of, a, a, as a, um, I'd say, a mutual fund than a REIT and so by way of operation did not go the full spectrum of how a REIT should um, operate and this led to the Securities and Exchange Commission really looking at the industry to see whether or not um, they will be able to open the way for REITs to operate and I must say that we had some um, foreign um, REITs that were looking to enter uh, or actually come into the country to invest but were held back because of the regulatory framework that currently or did exist at the time. So there has been um, quite a bit of lobbying in the, in the background with respect to the REIT law. And, and that led to the Security and Exchange Commission pushing to um, set up another law um, for, or I would say REIT legislation around about 2018 such that it will pave the way for REITs or foreign REITs or even local ones that are looking to invest in um, property by way of this indirect route to be able to set up their investments. Unfortunately, this legislation is still in draft stage and um, it will take industry players like us and the pension funds to be able to push or um, lobby to ensure that we are able to get the successful passage of the current REIT regulation. 
I must say that it also broaden the spectrum for investment opportunities for investors because these REIT funds obviously will list on, supposed to list on the Ghana Stock Exchange and create investment opportunities for players in the Ghanaian real estate market. Um, I must say though that the foreign based REITs have actually come into Ghana, they are settling, they have acquired properties. We have the, the great real estate group and from South Africa. In fact, all the players now, the current real, uh, real estate or the great, um, sorry, the REITs now are coming from South Africa. So we've got great real estate group, Actus, Growth Point Investec, who have their origins from the UK, but um, are coming in their African um, leg being Growth Point Investec coming from South Africa. And we also have Momentum Metropolitan Holdings Limited, who have invested heavily in the commercial real estate sector. Um, Grit's um, portfolio consists of commercial buildings, or sorry, office buildings. Actors had or have a mix of retail and commercial, whereas Growth Point investors are also across the retail and office investment. Momentum have been restricted to office at the moment, but they, I understand that they're also looking at other um, areas of, of, of real estate. So on the whole, um, the benefits of investing in REITs definitely um, is good, particularly for institutional investors like uh, insurance companies and pension trusts. Very good for them to be looking at this because of its long-term nature and the fact that it's safe and uh, it provides um, good liquidity in the event that you're pulling out because the shares of IREITs are readily traded on major stock exchanges and therefore it is very easy for portfolio managers to go in and be able to um, cash in on the investment as and when they do wish. It also provides good platform for portfolio diversification, which gives a very stable and um, stable yield because once you are able to diversify, you're able to um, protect your portfolio against shocks in the market. Um, once again, as said, because of the legislative provision for 90% of the income being paid out to investors, the yield and um, the dividend is quite substantial, which uh, gives a bit of comfort. And the, above all, it just provides some very good investment transparency with independent directors, um, analysts and auditors, as well as um, the financial reporting all being regulated by the REIT um, legislation. On the whole, um, what players like us um, can do is actually package such portfolios, um, put them in an REIT for the benefit of investors, and therefore we are able to assist in, 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 in that regard. So um, on, largely, that's basically as one of the main areas of um, indirect investment in Ghana, which is the REIT. Um, as I said, legislation is still in draft stage and therefore it will take um, industry players to push quite a lot in, in that direction. So we will call on you at some point to um, all have a contribution into that so we can have a common platform to push this legislation. So um, once again, okay. thank you to add this pension for the opportunity. And we hope that we should be able to come back to you again um, and, and help with this space. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, um, Tony, for your insightful presentation. I, I believe that a lot um, has been said and the interest certainly has been um, gingered up, especially between um, trustees and fund managers with regards to where they are going to put their funds. Um, because of time, we want to take just about a question or two um, so that we can wrap up um, quickly. Um, the first question um, is from an anonymous person and he's asking, what is the future of office spaces currently given the experience with COVID-19 and working from home concept? Would you want to respond to that? Okay. Um, at this stage, um, the COVID, as I said, COVID has presented uh, the market with um, a very complex um, nature of issues that we, we are having to deal with. 
as I said earlier, the market itself was gradually moving into uh, a flexible nature where there was uh, demand for flexible office spaces. COVID has accelerated that. And we now have uh, a phenomenon where most of us are working from home. We have a shift pattern at work and therefore the demand for office space is, is less. Having said that, the logistics that are required to have an effective, flexible working environment, particularly working from home, is still um, not well established. And therefore we believe that it will take a while for this working from home practice to even take root. So the trend is that, yes, we are probably gonna come back into our offices, primarily because of the existential um, issues like what I've just mentioned. However, there will still be um, that demand for flexible often, uh, office working spaces, which in itself is a phenomenon that we were anticipating. And therefore, we've realized that there are um, operators that are coming into the market who are operating these uh, flexible office spaces. But at this stage, it is very difficult to predict what the effects will be on the demand for office space, even though we believe that it will take a, a yet a gradual um, process uh, in terms of uh, its effect on effective demand. Okay. And another, I think it's a comment, but you, you may care to share your opinion as well. Um, it's from Doris, and she says, why are employees who contribute to SNET and other pension schemes not given the opportunity to at least own a two-bedroom house at the rate that can be deducted immediately they start contributing into pension schemes. Pension fund managers should be innovative in this direction to help the average Ghanaian. Do you have any comment on such? Mm, I, I know it, it's, it's something that's been thought about. When um, the industry was looking around for solutions to um, this affordable housing issue, particularly how the lack of mortgages is affecting the um, entry into the uh, housing ownership. And then the idea was mooted whether or not um, contributors to the pension fund will be given the opportunity to purchase their houses with their pensions being used as some form of um, collateral for these. And I, like I said, the, the biggest barrier to all of these has been the um, unit cost of um, development or the unit cost of uh, these houses. They're way beyond the affordability may range of most Ghanaian workers. And therefore, the work, a lot of attention will have to be paid at first to development costs, probably government waiving a lot more taxes on um, inputs, in construction inputs. We need a lot more local production of construction materials such that it is not, the industry is not vulnerable to foreign exchange um, shocks as well. And that is where it should start from. And I believe that once we are able to drive down the development cost, it, the, the, the cost of housing will now be brought into the range of many of our workers and then our SNITs and the other um, probably second or third tier pension funds will be able to look into that aspect. Okay. Um, LD Sefaji also wants to know why is real estate in Ghana so expensive compared to our West African region? I think there's a, there's a combination of a couple of things. And um, as I said, we, I think I, I even has, I have answered it in my previous one, is basically the cost of development. It is quite high when you look at the amount of taxes that are in the construction industry and the VAT regime on the construction inputs. Plus the fact that 85% of inputs into the building industry is imported and therefore, you have to factor in the um, dollar, um, I would say, uh, fluctuations on construction inputs. So when you do the math, usually you, there is a certain minimum that you have to charge to even make um, construction or investment in property viable. And that is why the starting point is usually quite expensive. And I must say that at this stage, um, one other bigger problem is the, the cost of financing which is also a, a, a big issue when it comes to uh, real estate development. The cost of finance in itself is so huge that you need to peg your asking rent at a certain point to make it even um, look attractive or for you to be able to service your 
the, your, your, your construction loans. Okay. Um, another, I think it's a question says that the reason for, for up to 90% dividend payout and 10% rollover, though beneficial to investors is largely for tax benefits to the trust. Um, how is this structured in the Ghanaian market in terms of tax rebate to the trust? Um, because the um, legislation is still in draft stage, we're not so much sure of the tax incentive that may come with investment in this sector. But I must say that if we're to look at what the model on which it was uh, actually based, which is coming from South Africa and a few other developed or I'll say more mature markets. There are tax incentives in um, investing in REITs or putting your investment, sorry, investing in real estate through a, a REIT and therefore just so to, to make it attractive. But we're not too sure as to the level of tax incentives are at this stage. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Tony. I think we would want to put the bricks on the questions here for now. Um, we would continue our conversation. I notice we still have a couple of questions trickling in, but because of time, we want to continue the conversation tomorrow during the um, Q&A panel discussion. So I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. We are very grateful for that insightful presentation that you did for us. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. I noticed we are still inching in the 300s of participants and that is very encouraging. Today has been very exciting. Um, we'd like to go close, um, go and take our closing remarks. And the closing remarks will be given by the general manager at Access Pension Trust in the person of Bakofi and Koma. Bakofi, if you are here, please, um, you can kindly give us your closing remarks now. Um, thank you very much, Jeff. Unfortunately, for some reason, I'm unable to activate my camera. Uh, but then I just want to say that um, who would have thought two hours would have just passed by so shortly? I mean, there's a lot to discuss. There's a, a lot of feedback coming in. And I must say that we are indeed grateful. I mean, um, I'm actually itching to hear from our remaining uh, panelists tomorrow. And I'm sure all of us on here can't wait for tomorrow's session. Um, at Access, the Pension Strategy Conference is here to stay. It continues to be core uh, of what we do. We, um, for us, we envision that 20% uh, of our Ghanaian workers should retire in dignity. Um, from the discussion so far, I am sure participants can identify that there's indeed a gap within our financial ecosystem and will agree with the organizers that's access and the CFA institute uh, that this pension strategy conference and the theme that is adding value to pension funds through alternative investments is, is indeed an important uh, theme. And I think the discussion should continue. I wish to express our uh, profound grati uh, gratitude to Courage Mate of Data Bank, uh, the insights he shared. I, I think my key takeaway is that while we continue to be moderately optimistic about the CD and our currency. Uh, and of course, yields continue to be subdued. Uh, we need to also critically look at funding or credit to the private sector as uh, government continues to, government borrow continues to crowd out that space. Pension funds uh, have the opportunity to bridge that finance, uh, the finance gap for the private sector. And I'm sure our speakers tomorrow will touch a bit more on that through the private equity presentation. Uh, for Kweku and Tony's presentation, I say thank you so much. Uh, it's been an, a very good eye-opening session for us. Uh, I think what I picked especially was uh, that there's a need to close uh, the duration gap, the generation gap, uh, that allows senior generations to release liquidity into businesses instead of owning real estate property. That way, opportunities are created for the young for them to also create solutions for all of us. I think this is a wild, a wild eye opener and I think we should, we should look at it. From the questions, there's a lot to, to, to talk about, to discuss. And I think this is a starting point. Uh, tomorrow, as mentioned, we'll be hearing from our private equity experts 
from Oasis Capital and Injaro. Please uh, join in early uh, so that you don't miss that. Um, after that presentation, those presentations will have the panel discussions and most of the pending questions from these discussions will be most likely ironed out. Um, once again, I want to say thank you to all of you uh, that participated in this, to the organizers, to our trustees especially who participated. I'm sure this conference um, would shape up our investment year. That's for 2021. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much as well, Pakofi. We are grateful to you. And so just like Pakofi said, we will continue the conversation tomorrow. All outstanding questions, we would respond to them tomorrow during our panel discussion as well. We also noticed that um, some of our participants were requesting for details of the presentation and highlights. We would share the highlights of these presentations on our website so that you can easily have access to it as well. In the event that you have any concern or issue, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to respond to it as well. Um, to our panelists, we would like to say thank you very much. Um, we would want to take a, a picture for all our panelists. We wish we could take it with um, the whole of attendees, but we'll take it with just the panelists. So we will take a closing prayer. And after the closing prayer, we would kindly ask our panelists to activate their video so we can take a, a group picture, even though it's digital on the platform. On that note, I'd like to invite Mr. Emmanuel Intre to close us with a prayer. Hello, Emmanuel. Hi, Jeff. Um, thank you very much. And um, please, shall we close our eyes and pray? Father, we thank you. We bless you for such a successful and fruitful session. Um, it is our prayer that you continually give us the grace and the wisdom and the resources we need, oh God, to be able to profit from this conference. We pray that may you keep all the participants, may you keep the panelists, keep all of us, even as we meet here again virtually tomorrow to continue this exciting and engaging discussions. We thank you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. We are grateful. So if our panelists can kindly activate their video and their cameras, we will just want to take a screenshot of all our panelists so that we can um, document it as to all of us who participated in this conference. Um, our, our colleague who is at the production end will take a picture and notify us once this is done. So maybe we'll just hold on for the next... Um, two or so seconds. And then once the screenshot is taken, we would notify all of us. All right. Thank you very much, Courage. Thank you, Kweku. Thank you, Efriye. Thank you, Tony. Very much, very much insightful um, a conversation. We look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. We still are in the area of 300 participants and we are very excited about that. Thank you very much and thank you um, once again. Do have a wonderful day and see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. with the same link. Cheers, right. bye. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you to you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. <laughs>